Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 2. Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. From the King James Version, the Bible reads like this. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. Amen. We started on this very topic, God's harvest, not in the night region, but those who were there. And we said there are certain things, we call them keys, that we need to note in this world for this month. And the first key we looked at was that Jesus, the word of God, is the one speaking here, and he used the truth, and whatever he says, is settled. The word of God is true, and whatever he says is certain. And the second thing we spoke about was that now that we have identified who is speaking, the second key was that he's telling us that the harvest is of the truth great. Amen. And we took some time to try to see what is the correlation between the harvest and Jesus talking to his disciples and even to us that we, we need to do something because there's something great about to happen. And we went to Genesis chapter 1, from verse 26 to 28, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where we identified the Bible speaking, saying, let us in his image and after his likeness. And then after creating man, he now blessed man. And after blessing man, he now commanded man. The Bible tells us God blessed them in verse 28 and then said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have you. And I told us over Friday night that this is the mandate that God has given us. And God did not just give us this mandate as his creation, as man, as man or woman. He gave us this mandate after giving us what we need to achieve it. For before God said unto man, be fruitful, the thing the Bible tells us he did first was that he blessed them. The Bible says male and female created in them, and then he blessed them. To bless there means that God gave a command to all forces, whether spiritual or physical, whether in the heavens, on the earth, or underneath the earth. He, by blessing, God gave a command to all those forces to begin to work together for your good, for my good, so that we can fulfill this mandate that God has given us. The mandate to be fruitful, the mandate to multiply, the mandate to replenish, the mandate to subdue, the mandate to have dominion. And we dug a little bit into that second key. And we're going to take off from there and continue as we look at God's events. But today we want to do a little detour. You know, we're still going to the same, we're on the same journey of God's events, but we want to take a little detour today. And look at the harvest of thanksgiving. The harvest of thanksgiving. A guaranteed harvest is one of the blessings that we have as God's children. It's one of the blessings that we have as children of the Most High God. In fact, it is our hope and confidence in God that His blessings for fruitfulness, His commandment for fruitfulness will become attainable in our lives. For as we read in Genesis chapter 128, every one of us have been blessed in heaven. Right from creation. Now, but due to the fall of man and the sinful nature of man, we lost that blessing. Because Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And they started operating. It was after they got kicked out that you see the effect of the curse that God placed on them begin to operate. But then, because God so loved us, He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, 
to bring us back to that blessing. That's why the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. And part of those things that become new is that you now have that blessing to be fruitful, to multiply. Every other thing that accompanies that accompany, uh, accompany the harvest. And that's why I know that in this month of God's harvest, you will be fruitful. In whatever area you are trusting God for increase, for fruitfulness, whether physically, spiritually, business wise, you will be fruitful in the name of Jesus. Always we need to remember that the price for our redemption has been paid. The price for our redemption has been paid. Outside of redemption, we cannot see the others. Talk more of entering into the others. But Jesus told uh, Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is filled with fruitfulness. So except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. So once we have surrendered our life and received the salvation that comes through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we now have access to God's harvest. We enter into the harvest of the Almighty God. And our response as individuals, as families, even as a church, must be one of sincere gratitude. Must be one of sincere gratitude to God. And one way we can show our gratitude to God is through our sacrifice of thanksgiving. Our sacrifice of thanksgiving. The way we thank God determines how grateful we are, how much we are appreciated. If you are expectant of an harvest, you present an harvest of thanksgiving to the Almighty God. Like somebody mentioned, that, you know, when you thank God for what he has done, it makes it possible for him to do more. The more you expect from God, the greater should be your thanksgiving to you. And we're going to see that. Let's take a lesson from Psalm 18, from verse 1 to 3, in the life of David. Psalm 18, from verse 1 to 3. I'm reading from the New King David Version. This is David speaking. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength. In whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemy. Our response of thanksgiving is based on two inseparable factors, two things that need to be there for your thanksgiving to be one that is acceptable to God, one that brings him pleasure. Two things. Number one, you see from that Psalm 18, verse 1, David started off by saying, I will love you, O Lord. The first factor is love. 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 And in this Psalm 18, that word translated love, it means to love deeply. It means to have tender intimacy. I mean, when I started looking at the root word and the meaning of it, the idea it gave is to love so much that you want to just hug the person or cling to the person. That's what David was saying. I will love you, O oh Lord. He's saying with tender intimacy, so much more that I want to hug you. If it were possible, I want to cling unto you. Another place you see that in scripture is in John chapter 20, when you read verses 16 and 17. John 20, 16 and 17. I'll read from the New Living Translation. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out 
Rabona, which in, in Hebrew is translated for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father, my Father, to my God. Jesus says, Don't cling to me because the kind of love that Mary Magdalene have for the Lord, he always wants to be intimate with him so much more than he wants to hug him. Having been there crying, that thinking that they have taken his body away, now that he saw him, he was going to pour his love upon him. Another example you see in Matthew 28 and verse 9. Matthew 28 and verse 9. When Jesus, having risen up from the dead, appeared unto his disciples, the Bible says, when they saw him, they met him and they greeted him, they ran to him, they grasped his feet and worshipped him. They touched him. Wanted to cling to him. Wanted to cling to him. When you offer thanksgiving to God, it must be from a heart that really want to hug God literally for what he has done for you. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. We that we have received so great a love from God ought also to display that love to him. Oftentimes, you know, people may look at you that you know, you're just doing too much. Amen. Amen. But if you have a God who is too much, you should do too much. Amen. I'll say that again. If you have a God who you consider to be too much, you should do too much. When people saw that woman who broke the alabaster box of spikenite ointment, Expensive perfume. Even Jesus' disciple looked at him and said, What a waste! What they were saying is, Woman, there are other ways you can show your appreciation. There are other ways you can give thanksgiving. Must you do it so lavishly? Amen. Must you break something expensive just so you can say thank you to God? That's what they were telling the woman. But Jesus says, the woman at home. What she has done now will become a memorial for her forever. You know, now one thing I talk about God is God has a way of whenever he wants to remember someone, the Bible tells us the book of Revelation that the books are open. Amen. Amen. There are some things you will do to show your appreciation for God today. That you will not reap the reward of it till maybe a year or more from now. That God will remember. That. And there's so there are ways that you will become so extravagant with your thanksgiving to God that God may not allow you to sleep like Solomon. Solomon wanted to say thank you to the one who took. A child that was born out of wedlock. Solomon knew that except for God, he cannot be where he is. He cannot have what he had. You know how many wives David had? You know how many of them were older than Solomon? But for God to now say Solomon will be the one that will be the heir to David. You know how many of them lobbied to become the head? You know how many of them even fought? One of David's sons even put him on exile so that he can have that throne. So when Solomon eventually fell, and I use the word fell, into the lap of Solomon, Solomon showed his gratitude. He did it in, in, in a lavish way, a way that no other king or prophet had never done before. And God could not just imagine the level, the depth of his gratitude. So God did not allow him to sleep. And God asked him, what would you have? What do you want me to do for you? Everything we do or offer to God must be out of love. Must be out of love. Your thanksgiving to God must show the depth of your love for God. 
Your thanksgiving to God must reveal how grateful you are for what God has done for you. It must show it from the inside. Your thanksgiving must surpass what God has done for you. Because the truth or the reality of things is, is what you see that you can be grateful for. What about those things you don't see? Like laying down and waking up the next day. Amen. Some blessings you can count. Amen. Oh, he give me a job. Give me a house. Give me a car. Give me a wonderful wife. Give me a wonderful husband. You know, he promoted me. And on and on and on. But then when you see the man on the ventilator, then you thank God for your lungs. But before then, you didn't know you had it. You didn't know the importance of your home. Amen. When you see that people lose their mortal skills and they cannot do anything, they have to depend on humans, on others. And I kid you not, it's, it's, it's not easy to depend on others. Oftentimes, people who lose their own control end up just committing suicide or something to get. Sometimes they do it out of I just want to let these people that worry over me to be free. May you not become a body to others. Bow your heads. Pray quickly. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, help me not to become a source of sorrow to anyone. Help me not to become a body to anyone. In the name of Jesus. Pray, pray from the depth of your heart. Do whatever you need to do in my life, oh God, so that I do not become a body to others, so that I do not become a source of sorrow, so that others will not gather to sorrow over me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we are praying. The Bible says, our labor of love in God's vineyard shall not be in vain. As a pastor, even as a minister, before I became a pastor, I was a pastor. That was one thing I realized in my relationship with God that made me who I am. And at the same time, others could not fully comprehend. You know, when you are in the midst of pastors that, you know, if workers offend, or people offend, they dish out punishment. Amen. Praise the Lord. They are so strict and disciplinary. Amen. I, I have come to realize that when you discipline somebody, two things can happen. Number one, if you discipline them that they are not doing what they're supposed to do, they should start doing it. They start doing it out of obligation. Because he said I must do it. And I don't want him to smack me for not doing it. So they keep doing it. They keep doing it. The other thing that can happen is that based on the severity of the punishment or the discipline, they could develop a thick skin. So what's he going to do? He's just going to punish me. He's just going to discipline me. And it does not get them to do what they want to do. That's how Paul felt. After he found out that a man committed incest in the church and they didn't do anything to him, they had to hand him over to Satan. Kick him out. But after a while, he prayed and then he said, he's going to bring him back. Amen. We don't want him to be lost. But when you fully understand the depth of love that God has for you, whatever you do for him will be out of love. And you say, love makes you want to do way beyond what men would expect. I'm sure you would have noticed that those people who truly love you, who truly love you, who beyond all, every reasonable doubt, you know that they love you. They are the last people you want to offend. Because even when you accidentally do something wrong to somebody who loves you, your heart will, 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 will break. It will break. That when you want to cry for, for forgiveness, it, 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 it's from the depth of your heart. That's the kind of relationship 
that God's word. And that's the kind of offering that does not end in vanity. Because it's a labor that is born out of love. That's why David said in Psalm 18 verse 1, I will love you at will. At will. Not somebody will compel me to. Not somebody will psych me to. I will. Because I know what you have done for me. I know where you found me. I know where I would be today if not for you. But because you love me, my thanksgiving to you must come from a sincere heart of somebody who knows the depth of love that God has. In 1 John chapter 3, 22 and 23, 1 John chapter 3, 22 and 23, the Bible reads in New King James Version like this. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. That first John 3 is resting on what uh, John already said in Jesus said rather in John chapter 14, verse 15. John 14, 15, where he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. If you love me, keep my commandments. You want to show you love me, do what I ask you to do. Same thing, maybe the mother of Jesus at the wedding in Canaan told the servant, anything he asks you to do, do it. Because whenever you do what he asks you to do, it's an indication that you love him. It's the same thing with, with, with speak to children, we speak to kids. If you truly love me, when I ask you to do something, you do it. But when I ask you to do something and you don't do it and you say, Mom, I love you, not lie. <laughs> Amen. If you truly love me, I ask you to do it, you do it. That brings pleasure. That is that becomes acceptable. And the command leads us to love others also. But James made it very clear. If you cannot love men that you see, how much more can you not say, Lord, I love you? Who's deceiving who? That's why Jesus, when they were lining up to bring offering, and he saw them, he said, listen, if you have anything against anyone, he said, first of all, keep your offering somewhere. Go and fix that problem. Then come back with the offer. That's the best advice that Jesus ever gave a man. Because there are some things, there's some labor that you'll be doing that will be in vain. Because don't get that scripture twisted. It says the labor of love. That's the one that will not be in vain. But the labor that is born out of obligation, out of religion. That one would just be in vain. So uh, Jesus does not want, he says, go first. Go and love your neighbor. And then you can come and say, Lord, I love you. I want to give you something. Amen. Amen. And then it becomes accepted. The thanksgiving must rest on that first factor, which is love. 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 And you see, I've said this several times in this assembly, that, you know, Say you love me. The only way I can know is what you are giving. Amen. The Bible speaks about God in John 3 16. For God so loved the world. What follow? Gave. And what he gave, how spectacular was it? The Bible says it was his best, his only best. So that you and I can become his best. Amen. And in so doing, when you stay, you give thanksgiving. And you know, as my early life. As a Christian, it was the eastern part of Nigeria. I keep talking about it when I went to do my youth service. That on Thanksgiving Sunday, there's chaos. Amen. Because some ushers are chasing chicken that is running about, and some are trying to tell the owners of goods to hold their goods very well. Amen. Because on Thanksgiving Sunday, when those villagers come to give Thanksgiving, it's out of a heart of gratitude. They are coming not empty-handed. They have some have goats, some have uh, groceries. Some they bring all manner of things to show their deep gratitude. 
for somebody who loved them so much, save their soul. This month of God's harvest, show your gratitude for the death of God. If you are telling God thank you, give that, don't just put it inside your heart, give your thank you with voice. Make it as loud. Let people hear it and wonder what is going on. And then you can tell them your testimony. If you are offering him an offering of thanksgiving, do it very well. Be methodic, methodical about it. Preplan it. The purpose of preplanning something is that you have put your mind to it. It's not something on the spot of the moment. It says offering time. Oh, um, what do I have here? Okay, I have 10 bucks. Okay. Osha, can you help me split this one? Preplan it. Preplan it. That woman that gave a widow's might, do you think she decided on the spot of the moment? If she did, she would give anything. She came from home before it was time for offering with that widow's might and said, This one, I'm going to give it to God. Gratitude shown out of love. It's Christ as thanksgiving. The second factor that your thanksgiving rests upon, I say two inseparable factors. The first one is love. The second one is dependence. Dependence. Total dependence, if you must put it, or complete dependence. Still in Psalm 18, from verse 1 to 2, Psalm 18, verse 1 to 2, when you read through, you see David. Started off by saying, I will love thee, O Lord. And then it switched and started with my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my... And it goes on and on. And in speaking, David uses the personal pronoun. My, amen. My, my, my strength. My rock. My fortress. My deliverer. I mean... As I begin to hear myself reading it over and over, I'm beginning to sound like a little child. Amen. You know that that, that, those, that word "my" is the first, it looks like it's the first word that most children truly, truly understand, and they use it very well. My, either my or mine. My toy. They may not know anything else, but that's my toy. My daddy, my mommy, my book, my, my, my. And you see, in saying that my is because they know that which belongs to them. They know that which belongs to them. David knew who he belonged to. So he can always depend on him. That's why I say God is my rock my fortress, my strength, my salvation, in the honor of my salvation, in other translation, my high tower is expressing childlike faith in his relationship with God, in his dependency on God himself. He knows that every ounce of his strength comes from God. He knows that everything he has, go and look through Psalm. David gets personal with God because he knows it. He, in another psalm, he says, uh, I will look up to the hill from where is coming my help. My help. He said, my help comes. In another psalm, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. My, my. With that language, David is revealing his dependency on God. You want to give thanksgiving to God? Out of love, you must also reveal your dependence on him. But for you, Lord, that's the language of dependence. That's the language. But for God, God did it. You know, God. When you testify, testimony is comes along with it with the spirit of prophecy. Because as you're giving testimony, you're also sending something into the life of somebody listening. Amen. 
And through your testimony, people can receive dependence on God. And it's that dependence on God that transfers to them, first causes them to depend on God themselves and see results. Thanksgiving must rest on you depending on God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace of God. It's, it's not me yet, but the grace of God which was upon me or which was with me. That's gratitude expressed out of love and showing dependence on God. I am who I am because of God, by the grace of God. I have what I have by the grace of God. It's not because I know how to run. It's not because I'm smarter than the next guy who didn't have it. It's by the grace of God. I got that job only by the grace of God. It's not because you know, I'm well connected than the other guy, than the other candidate. It's just by the grace of God. I'm still keeping the job by the grace of God. I have children by the grace of God. God blesses you not because of who you are or what you have done, but because of who he is. Bible says God is love. Oh, yeah. And you see, one thing about love is love is quick to respond to God. Amen. Amen. Say that again. Love is always quick to respond to God. And that's what the scripture means when it says, draw near to God. And it will draw near to you. You express your love to Him, you will experience His love like never before. It's, it's, it's a two way. In John 15, verse 5, John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Having that understanding that without depending on God, life becomes difficult. To spoil what to want to depend upon you. And brethren, there's nothing more enjoyable than depending on God. I mean, I'm like a little baby in the stroller when it comes to dependence on God. I hope you guys understand what I'm talking about. A little baby in a stroller. The baby just lies there. It's the father or the mother that worry about covering it so that the son will not touch that baby. Amen. Did the Bible not say the son shall not smite you by day. It's because as far as God is concerned, you depend on him like a baby in a stroller. The baby in the stroller is not worried about the traffic. He's not worried about how he's going to get in the house. When it's time to get in the house, dad or the mom will mostly be there. Will click and then carry the baby in. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Maybe the solar feel uncomfortable in little shifts and just cries. What happened? The parents they try to find out what is wrong. They try to make the child comfortable. That is say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. What happened? Oh, God washes them. He just wants to do something. Those who depend on him. Those who, Bible never goes far to say that they are not put to shame. Those who trust in the Lord. I know what it means when scripture says those who trust in the Lord and trust them means dependent. Those who trust in the Lord shall not be put to shame. What that means is that they will not even know that anything that can cause shame is coming. It doesn't matter. Sit like a baby in the stroller. Amen. The baby in the stroller throws the leg somehow to expose his nakedness. Who worries about nakedness? He just cover it. Amen. Have you not read in the scripture saying, Lord covers the multitude of sin? There are some of us that for some things we have done, we should have been put to shame, exposed, disciplined, or something terrible happened to us. But because God is love. It covers that shame as much as we let rest in it. In Philippians 4.13, Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not because I have the ability, but because 
I'm depending on somebody who has the ability. In our Bible reading today, we see that the Bible is in Psalm 107, where it says, starts with all that men will praise the Lord. You see, they do something wrong against God, God punishes them. And then you see the Bible in that same psalm, we say, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and the Lord delivered them out of all their distresses. Out of all. Out of all. is the one punishing them. But when they cry again, it comes to That's a father, a parent-child relationship. A parent-child relationship that causes God to always want to come to your aid. So as you offer God thanksgiving to him, do it out of love. Do it to show him that you depend on him. Do it to show him that you depend on him. That's the that's what caused trouble for David's wife, Micah. That's what caused trouble for her. She looked through the window as they were bringing the Ark of Covenant of God and saw David thanking God with his dance moves. He danced so much more that the Bible says the clothes of his body fell off. And the wife was wondering, you a whole king. But has gotten into you that you are dancing before your people naked. And let me say this. You might think I'm dancing before the people there. I'm not dancing before them. I'm dancing before my God. The one who made me king over your father. Hallelujah. That's what I'm dancing for. I'm always amazed every time. I see a dog in the presence of his owner. I don't know if you've experienced seeing the dog in the presence of the owner. It's as if the dog does not even know what to do. Sometimes he can run forward, turn upside down, wag his tail, wag his body, he's just jumping all over. What do you think the dog is doing? It's expressing his love for the owner and his dependency on the owner because the owner that takes care of him that gives food, that gives everything, treats and everything, belly rubs and everything. So it's displaying thanksgiving from love, from dependence. That's by it. Have you experienced the love of God? Has God shown you the depth of his love? Let's start off by thanking God for the salvation of your soul. Just thank you. Thank you. And if you are here, you are hearing this message, and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, you have not surrendered your life to your maker, you have not received that saving grace that restores the blessings of God upon you, that takes you back and makes you a new creature, filled with the mandate of faithfulness. But today you've heard this message and you're saying, you know what, Pastor? Pray for me. I want to surrender my life to my maker today. So that I know who indeed is in control of my life. If that is your own heart desire, just put up your hand wherever you are and I'll pray with you. You are watching online also. I want you to open up your heart. I just pray this prayer. It might sound simple. But it's a prayer that shows your dependence. For he says, without me, you can do nothing. So just say a simple prayer. Say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity I have to surrender my life to you. Please have mercy on me. Forgive me my sins. Wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. Write my name in the book of life. From today, give me the grace I need to continue to walk with you till I see you in glory. Thank you for hearing my cry. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for accepting me as your child. In Jesus' name. Let's all rise up.